Lecture 3, Forecasting. A forecast is a statement about a future variable. We're really familiar with things like weather, where you forecast what temperature is it going to be tomorrow at 3. And the second is um, demand, resource availability, those are other forecasts. So a forecast is important to be able to make informed decisions. So there's two important aspects of forecast. The first is the expected level of demand. So you assume that the demand is going to be based on some structural variation, such as a trend or a seasonal variation and you're able to forecast that demand. The second is the accuracy. Um, so how big is the potential error of this uh, forecast? So there's a couple of major uses for forecast. The first is the long range planning a system. So you're planning a system long range, what are the types of products and services you're going to offer, uh, how, how big a facility do you need, what kind of equipment do you need, where are you going to put that facility. All of those are long range decisions. The second is really using the system, which is short and medium range plans. So you use forecast to manage your inventory, you uh, manage your workforce levels. Do you, how many people do you need when? Purchasing, how much do you need to purchase? Uh, production, how many of these should you produce in anticipation of demand? Uh, budgeting and scheduling, all of those um, rely on forecasts. So forecasts are not perfect. There's always some random variation that will be present and some error, even if you have all factors accounted for. So here's some good elements of good, good forecast. It should be timely. It doesn't do any good to have a forecast for tomorrow that isn't ready until tomorrow. Um, if, if I want to forecast about tomorrow, today, it needs to be today. It needs to be timely needs to be accurate. Um, so you don't want it to be too wrong. You, you want it to be reasonably accurate. It should be reliable. In other words, it should work over and over and over. And it needs to be expressed in meanif meaningful units. That's something that you as an organization understand. If it's a uh, number of customers, that's um, a, a, a meaningful unit. Um, it should be in writing. You can't just say it. It should be written down. Here is our written forecast. The advantage of a written forecast is then you can actually measure its error after the fact. Uh, it should be easy to use and, and understand. So if if it's so complicated that no, no one understands the, how the forecast was generated, um, it may not be used or it may not be trusted or it may be actually be trusted too much. It should be cost effective. You don't want something that's so expensive that the value of the forecast is more is less than just ignoring and just go with it. So here's the forecasting process. The first is determine your purpose. So why do you need this forecast? Establish a time horizon. A time horizon is how far into the future do you want to look? Do you want to forecast for tomorrow, for next week, for next month, for next year, uh, five years from now? You know, that's the horizon. Then you need to obtain, clean, uh, obtain data. So you obtain the data, you clean the data, and you analyze the data. So you have to have been collecting data in order to have data to make a forecast. Uh, and then you select a forecasting technique. And we'll go into these forecasting techniques later on in this lecture. 
You'll make a forecast, and then this is important, you monitor the forecast errors. Forecast accuracy and control. So you need to make allowance for forecast errors. So if you can quantify what you expect the error to be, then you can take that into account. If you say, we think we're going to have 400 customers tomorrow, but it might be 450, you can plan for 450 in such a way that um, if 450 show up, you won't be hurting. You'll have enough inventory, enough staff. Forecast errors should be monitored. So a forecast, the error is the actual minus the forecast. And you want to have some bounds, acceptable bounds. And if you go beyond those bounds, then take corrective action. So here's some accuracy metrics. The first is something called mean absolute deviation. So you take the actual minus the forecast and take the absolute value of that. The, those bars on each side mean absolute value. You sum them all together and divide by the number. And now you have the mean absolute deviation. So how far off were you? And then the next one is mean squared error. So this, you take the actual minus the forecast, you square it, divide by n minus 1. And that weights the error. So the big, bigger errors impact you more than the smaller errors because they're squared. And then there's the mean absolute percentage errors, MAPE. That's where you take the actual minus forecast, take the absolute value of that, divide by actual, multiply by 100, divide by n. So what you have is a percentage of the error. So here is example calculations. So right here we're at period 1. The actual was 107, the forecast was 110. So here's your error. Actual minus forecast, 107 minus 110 equals minus 3. Now you have the absolute value of that, which is a 3. And then the error squared is minus 3 times minus 3, which is 9. And then you have this error divided by actual times 100. So this is this error, 3, um, divided by the actual which is 107 and then multiplied by 100. So that's 2.8%. Now you can take this for several periods and down here you have some calculations. So you take the sum of these errors is 13, the sum of the error squared is 39, and then the sum of the percentages is 11.23. Here for the MAD, you divide by N, which is 5, you get 2.6 is your MAD. And then the uh, mean squared error, you, you divide 39 by N minus 1, and you get 9.75. And then this uh, mean average percentage error, uh, this you take the percentage divided by um, 5 is 2.25%. So there's a couple of forecasting approaches. The first is qualitative forecasting, and the second is quantitative forecasting. So qualitative forecasting includes soft data, soft information. Things like human factors, personal opinions, hunches. I have a hunch that tomorrow we won't have as many. Well, I don't know why that is, but my hunch seems to be right. And these factors are difficult or impossible to quantify. You can't put a number on it. The second is this quantitative forecasting, and these rely on hard data. So you, you use actual historical data. You come up with some causal variables to make the forecast, and then you make a, a, a numeric forecast or a quantitative forecast. Qualitative forecasts are subjective inputs such as in, uh, opinions, 
uh, from customer surveys, sales staff, managers, executives, experts. So executive opinion. So a small group of upper managers meet and collectively develop a forecast. The advantage is you have a lot of history. They tend to be senior. They, they know what's going on. They may not be in touch with the latest trends. So they, they may, it, some of those opinions may be a little bit dated or in a, in a vacuum. Salesforce opinions. So the sales force, customer service staff, the reason they're good sources of information is they are talking to customers. And they may be aware of future plans of customers. So a, a member of the sales force could be talking to a customer and he, he says, I this may be the last order that I'm making for a while because it seems like our demand is going down. So in that case, the number still shows that they made an order, but they said qualitatively, we don't expect to make a future order. If you talk to all the sales staff and they're getting the same kind of, of, of conversations, that could mean that the sales is going down. Customer surveys. So you can go actually ask your customers for demand input. Um, typically, this would be a sample of customer opinions. There's a couple other approaches. Um, managers could solicit inputs or opinions from other managers, staff, or even outside experts. And then there's this Delphi method, which you could use with any of these groups, but it's an iterative process that's used to achieve consensus. Time series forecasts. So uh, a forecast um, is based on recent time series observation. So a time series is an ordered sequence of obs observation at regular intervals. So let's say every day you count how many customers you have every day. And that's a time series. You could also do it every hour or every week or whatever that time series is, you, you measure that observation. And then the assumption is that future values in the time series can be estimated based on previous values. So one, one thing that we're familiar with is a trend. So it's a long-term upward or downward movement. If, if you're a company, an organization, you tend to want to have a long-term upward trend. Um, this can take into account population shifts. There's more and more people changing income, people have more and more money. And then seasonality. So seasonality, we think of seasonality in terms of an annual season, you know, winter, summer, uh, winter, spring, summer, and fall. But it can also be very short term. It can be daily, such as a restaurant, where at lunch you have a seasonal variation where it goes up at lunch and down in the afternoon, up for dinner. Uh, and down to close. Um, you can also have seasonal variation during the week where Monday there's less people at the restaurant, Tuesday there may be more, Friday there may be a whole bunch, Saturday, Sunday, you know, there's these, you can sort of expect when things are going to be busy. And this can be with service call centers, theaters, the reason that you, um, get a cheaper ticket during the day um, is because less people go then to, to, you know, so you can get a matinee because less people go. That's a seasonal variation. So they give you a deal. Cycles and variation. So a cycle is a long-term variation that's lasting more than a year. So these are a variety of economic, political, agricultural conditions. The weather goes up and down. The economy goes up and down. The politics tend to shift back and forth. So those are cyclical variations. There's an irregular variation is, is something that you, a lot of times you can explain it, but it's not typical. Something like a labor strike, a weather event, a hurricane hits and and suddenly it disrupts everything. 
random variation, there's always random variation. No matter how good your model is, there, there's going to be just random variation. The, the number of customers goes up and down no matter how well you, you predict it. It's going to go up and down some. So here's some graphic examples of data. So right up here, you have a trend. See how it's going at a nice upward trend. But here, there's an irregular variation, something like a strike or some, kind, some reason there's a spike in demand right there. And then the next one is, is cycles. So you see how it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And so these, the, the time on this is multiple years going up and down, up and down. And then the bottom one here is seasonal variation. So in April time frame, people order a bunch. And then in October, November, they order a whole bunch. And you can see that the company is growing because there's a trend here that you can see from year one, it goes up, year two, it goes up, year three, it goes up, year four, it goes up. So there's an upward trend with seasonal variations on top of that. Now, if you're just if you don't understand the seasonal variations right here, you can see if, if you just started looking at this data and you say, oh, we have an upward trend, we have an upward trend. But if you look at previous years, you always go up during that time frame, and then it drops off. So it's, it's really good to, to graph your data to actually see what's going on. So the first time series forecast technique is called a naive forecast. You've heard of someone who's naive, they'll believe anything. Well, this is just the name of this. It, what it uses is the single previous value of a time series as the basis for the forecast. So yesterday um, we had 10 customers, so we're going to predict that today we're going to have 10 customers. So this, this can be used very well with a stable um, time series. Um, it can also be used with seasonal variations because as the season goes up, um, yesterday is a good indication that it's going up. And it can be used with a trend. If you have a long-term trend, you can actually put a bias with the naive forecast. For example, um, we seem to be going up one customer a day. So um, what was yesterday's? Yesterday we had 100 customers. So we're going to say that today we're going to expect 101 customers. Tomorrow we are going to expect 102. It's just, it's, we're just using yesterday to predict today. So then you can use time series forecasts. This is where you take an average. So there's, there's different techniques to take these averages. Uh, they, they handle gradual changes. And, and help to smooth out some of that randomness in the data. So the first is a moving average, and that's uh, where you simply um, average the last few points. Um, then a weighted moving average, and then exponential smoothing. So here's a moving average. So what it does is it takes some number of, of samples, um, here it's you know it's it's n number of samples. So uh, let's say that you have uh, four samples here. Uh, one, two, three, four. You need to divide by four. So you say yesterday, the day before, the day before, and the day before. You count the number of customers. You add it all up. Divide by four, and that is your moving average. Then tomorrow you will drop off. The, the four days ago, and it'll be the new four days ago. So it's 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 moving along and, and gives you an, a moving average. So as new data becomes available, um, the forecast is updated to the newest value. So you drop the oldest and recompute the average. So the sensitivity of the model is Fewer data points is more responsive, more data points is less responsive. 
So if you have a big jump or it's, it's trending upward fairly fast, the moving average will always be behind. But if you're averaging in fewer data points, it'll be more responsive, it'll actually be more accurate. But it's also more uh, susceptible to random variation if you have fewer data points. A weighted moving, moving average, you can actually assign weights um, to each of these data points. So yesterday, we're going to assign a weight of 0.5. The day before, we're going to assign a weight of 2.5 or, or 0.25. And, and you go down to something that was a long time ago. It might be 0.1 or something. You put the weights on there, so whatever is most important, maybe the most recent, has more weight in, in the calculation. This requires, it's somewhat arbitrary, and you might want to do some trial and error. One of the advantages, if you have a whole bunch of historical data, you can test your model on the historical data and calculate errors. So last year, you go through, you use this weighted average to see how well it predicted the next day's value or the next month's value. Exponential smoothing is a way of adding in the forecast error. So here in this case, you have last time's forecast, and you know what the error was, so the actual minus the forecast. And so in calculating this forecast, you include in it this error. And what that does is it, is it um, smooths it to, to correct for biases in the forecast. Linear trend. So this is fairly easy. You have a slope of a line, you have a bias and or an offset and you come up with a you can put a nice straight line that's called a linear trend so there's several t techniques for seasonality um, first they can be um, expressed as actual values that deviate from the average value in the series so one model is an additive seasonality. So you have a model for the seasonality and you add that to the other model. So you, you've calculated out, maybe you have a trend and you add on to it seasonality. Another model is multiplicative. And so what you're actually doing is multiplying your model by whatever you're using the, to model the other things. So you multiply the seasonality by the, the other uh, um, prediction or, or forecast. There's some associative, for, uh, associative forecasting techniques. This is where you look at other predictor variables. So here's an example. Home values, uh, like Zillow, it, it predicts your home value. Well, it takes into account several things. Where is your property located? What is the property size? Uh, how many bedrooms do you have? How many bathrooms? All of those are put into a model. And from there, you, you know how much other houses in the area are selling for. And that predicts the value of your house. Simple learning, linear regression. This is uh, a a method to calculate a, a line. This is really good with a trend. So you, if it's a straight line trend, you can calculate the, the slope of that line and use that slope to predict, um, to create your forecast. So there's some issues to consider. First, you always want to plot the line to verify the linear relationship is, is appropriate. So you can do a lot of this, this fitting in Excel, and Excel will plot it for you. And um, so you use that the data may be time dependent. So you can use analysis of time series. 
You can use time as an independent variable in a multi-regression analysis. This requires um, multiple statistics. And, um, and if you don't have very good correlation, that may indicate that there's other variables that are important. If you try to do this linear thing, and there may be a cycle that needs to be taken into account or a seasonal variation that needs to be taken into account. You take those two together, you'll get a more accurate model. So there's, you want to mod, monitor your forecast. So you track forecasting errors, analyze them to provide insight into whether your forecasts are performing the way you want to. So there's several sources of errors. The first is you may have omitted an important variable. Um, there could be a shift or a change um, in a variable that the model just doesn't handle. And there may be a new uh, a variable that has appeared. Um, you can also have irregular variables, something like weather or a strike. You can have random variation. So uh, you're, you may have a very good model, but it just has random variation in it. So if you can identify that it's random variation, you just want to account for that in your, in your forecast. Control charts are really useful for identifying non-random error in forecasts. Um, so we're going to go into detail on, on control charts in a future chapter, but control charts are useful for, for forecasts. And if you track the errors, you can use it to detect a bias. If, if you watch, watch your forecast and your fo forecast is consistently 2% um, low, maybe you just want to add 2% to your forecast to get it more accurate. So there's different methods to for uh, choose your forecast technique. Um, factors to consider, you want to consider cost. Um, the reason that you're forecasting is to reduce cost. So if you can quantify how much you're saving by having a good forecast, you want to have a return on investment for the cost of forecasting. Uh, you, you don't want to spend thousands of dollars on a forecast when the value of that forecast is only hundreds of dollars. How accurate do you need? Um, and the availability of historical data. If you're not keeping track of things that you need to put in the model, uh, don't use that model. Start keeping track of data. Is it, maybe you can use it in the future. There's forecasting software. Is that available to you? It, simplistically, you can use an Excel spreadsheet. You could go into a more complex statistics package. The, the other thing to consider is time. How much time does it take to gather, analyze the data, and prepare a forecast? If it takes you three days to prepare a forecast for tomorrow, that's not going to do you any good because you're, you're going to get the forecast three days from now. You don't even need a forecast. If it takes longer, you know, how long does it take to create that forecast? And then the other consideration is your forecast horizon. How far into the future are you trying to forecast? So here's your operation strategy. So if you have better forecast, you're able to take advantage of future opportunities and reduce potential risks. So a worthwhile strategy is to work to improve first the short-term forecasts. So you get accurate up-to-date information, um, can have a significant effect on forecast accuracy. Um, your prices, your demand, other important information, all of that goes into your short-term forecast. Another thing you can do is reduce the time horizons forecasts have to cover. So rather than saying, I want to know how much I, you know, what, what do I forecast for two months from now? Maybe I can live with one month from now, or maybe I just need a one-week forecast. Reducing that forecast horizon increases your accuracy and um, may reduce the cost of the forecast. And then sharing your forecast and demand data throughout the supply chain. So when you 
talk to your suppliers, when you talk to your customers and share that demand data that's forecast across the supply chain and they share with you their forecast, that can really improve the quality of the forecast. So here's a summary. So a forecast is a statement about the future value of a variable of interest. There's a couple of forecasting approaches, the qualitative forecasting and then the quantitative forecasting. And then we talked about trends and seasonality.